Okay, everyone, uh, welcome to the meeting of Social Services Scrutiny Committee on the 15th of June 2021. Um, just a few things like to highlight with you. Uh, this meeting will be recorded and made available to view by the councils via Teams on the council's website, except for discussions involving confidential or exempt items. Therefore, the images, audio, or these individuals speaking will be publicly available to all via the recording on the council's website at www.cafili.gov.uk. Okay, so we shall go on to item one is to receive apologies. Kath, has there been any apologies? Yes, Chair, we have apologies from Councillor John Bevan and Councillor Vincent James. Okay, thanks, Kath. And uh, will you do, now do a roll call for us, please? Yes, yeah, certainly, Chair. Uh, members of the committee, if I call your name, can you please indicate present verbally? Thank you. Councillor Angel. Present. Councillor Bazina. Present. Councillor Bishop. Present. Councillor Cushing. Present. Councillor Etheridge. Present. I know you're here, Councillor Ketheridge. Yeah, I'm here. Can you? Can... <laughs> yeah, you can hear you. Uh, yeah. Councillor Evans. Present. Councillor Guy. Present. Uh, I can't see Councillor Gale or Councillor Haas on the call. Um, go south to Councillor Jeremiah. Yeah, present. Uh, Councillor Leonard. Present. Councillor Skibbons. Yeah, present. Um, just for the chair, I, I have to go to a, a, another meeting at seven o'clock, so um, may have to leave this meeting after half past six. Thank you. Councillor Thomas. Present. Councillor Williams. Present. And the co-opted member, Councillor uh, Mrs Jones. Present. And we have the cabinet member present, Councillor Cook. Yeah, present. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Item two then, declarations of interest. Councillors and officers are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and or prejudicial interests in respect to any item of business on this agenda in accordance with the Local Government Act 2000, the Council's Constitution and the Code of Con Conduct for both councillors and officers. Um, are there any declarations? Now, I myself have to um, submit a declaration on item nine, uh, which is the co-opted member vacancy. Is there anybody else would like to declare any interest? No? Okay, we'll go on to agenda item three, which is the social, social Services Scrutiny Committee held on the 27th of April, 2021. Now I'm going to go through them page by page rather than item, okay? So page one. Oh, Carmen, uh, Councillor Bizzini, Bizzina, sorry. Thank you. Can I just firstly start as, as Vice Chair, just to congratulate you, uh, Councillor Cushion, on uh, your appointment as, as Chair of uh, this Scrutiny uh, Committee, but also I want to pay Big thank you to to uh, Councillor Lyndon Biden as well. He did a, a fantastic job. Um, so I just like to record that. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Carmen. He did. I just hope I can live up to uh, his standards. <laughs> thank you, Carmen. Right, page one of the minutes. Page two. And page three. Can we have a proposal and a seconder, please? I'll move that. Thank you, Councillor Jeremiah. I second. I second, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Williams. I think that means then we. Um... Oh, no, sorry. Item number four. I do apologise. Thank you very much. We'll take, we'll take a vote, Chair. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I do apologise. Can we take a vote then on. Oh, yes. It's a poll vote. Um, I told him living up to his, um, his standards on this item, please. Oh, God, I can I just come in on this? 
I yeah. was absent due to bereavement at the last meeting, so uh, I guess it's best to abstain. Yeah. That's correct. You can take a verbal vote from Councillor Bishop and, and for her to abstain because she wasn't a member of the committee at the time. Yeah, I will abstain. Thank you, Councillor Bishop. OK. Carmen, your um, hand up is function still on. Is um, everybody uh, able to vote? Because um, I'm not seeing anything on mine. Uh, Councillor Gary, you might want to do a verbal vote because you're having technical okay. problems. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK. You for against it? Yeah, I'm for, I'm for it, please. Chair, that's a, that's a passed unanimously. OK, thanks then, uh, Kath. Right, item four is to consider any matter referred to this committee in accordance with the call-in procedure. Um, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been any. Kath, do you have any further information? No, that's correct, Chair, there's none. OK, we'll go on to uh, agenda item five, which is the Social Services Scrutiny Committee Forward Work Programme. That's over to me, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just I just like to draw members' attention to Appendix One, which is the um, the meetings uh, the next meeting of the scrutiny committee. Um, as members will see, uh, we have four items planned. Um, we've been asked to consider um, adding an additional item <clears throat> to the September meeting on day services. Um, in order to accommodate that, if members are agreeable, we, we could move the period three budget report 2021 to 22 into an information item. Uh, bearing in mind the next meeting in October, we do have a budget a period five budget report. So you will be considering on the main agenda then. So if members are happy to um, agree those changes, um, I can post the, the forward work programme on the council website. Do we have to um, vote on that then, Kath? Uh, Chair, yeah, I think you wanted to propose an additional item as well. I did indeed, yes. There was an item in, uh, being brought forward for, for the December meeting, which is uh, an item Bev in the Health Board uh, presentation. And I'd like to, in, a, in addition to that, and I hope that you will agree with me, is to bring in about the COVID update for the Council. That's absolutely fine, Chair. We can certainly bring you up to speed. So that's in the December meeting, just for my records. Yeah, I yeah, think it's December, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Uh, and in terms of next month's meeting, as, as Kath's already alluded to, you will get a uh, month five budget report um, in the following meeting, which will, will be for discussion. It's just obviously the reopening of day services is a particularly pertinent item to us, and we really need to bring that to you in September. So if you could bear with us for the September meeting and accept those changes, then we, we should be back on track. OK, well, I'm happy to do that because I know how pertinent the day service issue is, actually, because um, I have been receiving emails regarding this issue. So, yes, I'm quite happy for that. Are all members agreeable? Um, should we do we need a proposal and a seconder for this issue, Kath? Apologies, Chair, I was thrown out of teams for a second. I just come back in. <laughs> what all was right. the question? <laughs> do we need a proposal and a seconder regarding the issue regarding the budget then to be discussed uh, to be as the um, oh God, I've forgotten what it's called. I do apologise. Yeah, just, to, just to agree that the, the changes have been discussed, i.e. that the day service is coming to September, the yeah. budget becoming an information item and the additional That's item it. for Garvo. Somebody out ready to move that. Yeah. Can I have a move and a second there, please? Councillor Williams, you're on oh, mute. I'll second the ship. Yeah. Okay. Happy to say, um, yeah, I think sorry. we've got quite a few uh, people who were proposing and seconding, Kath. Uh, do we yeah, we go, yeah we'll take a vote now, yes, Chair. Is it going to be done via poll? Yes, Chair. OK. Do you want to take a verbal from Councillor Guy and Councillor Bishop? Yeah, Councillor Guy, uh, yeah. how do you um, vote on this Four. issue? Four, please. Councillor Bishop? Four, please. OK. That's moved, Chair. OK, lovely. I think now we need to go on to... Sorry, I'm flicking back and forth on screens. I do apologise. 
Um, it's the social services and screw. No, that one. Sorry, it's the mispresentation. Sorry, I do apologize. <laughs> Right, Councillor Cook, Cabinet Member and Day Street Corporate Director, Jenny Wellam, Regional Programme Director for MIST, and Dr. Now, is that J Jael or Jail Hill from the NHS? It's Jail, thank you. Jail. Right, um, so welcome to this meeting of the Scrutiny Committee, both of you. And if you'd like to go forward then with your presentation, please. Yeah. Councillor Cook, Chair. Sorry? Councillor Cook, Chair. Councillor Cook. All oh, right, sorry, I do your hands up, Councillor Cook. I, I do apologise. It's all right, Chair. I'm because I'm crossing over screens and I haven't done this for a while, so you're gonna have to forgive me. I've been doing everything all on the one screen because I've been practically living and sleeping downstairs lately. With no, my, don't uh, worry, don't worry, Bray. Thanks, thanks for bringing me in. I just want to well congratulate you first of all for becoming Chair. Oh, thank I, you, Chair. Wish you all the best. <laughs> Any support you need. And I also want to welcome our new councillor to the scrutiny committee, Councillor Bishop, as well. Um, uh, yes. So members will recall a previous presentation to scrutiny on this subject. Members were so taken aback by the achievements that they made. They asked for a further update. So yeah. tonight we have Jenny Wellman, programme director, hosted by Caffilly, and Dr. Jail Hill, a consultant child psychologist and clinical director from MIST, who will provide a further update and will be happy to answer any questions members may have. Thank you, Chair. Oh, thank you then, Shane. OK, can we proceed then with the presentation? Thanks both. Yeah, thank you very much for asking us to come back. I hope you can hear us fine. I'm going to go to sharing my screen because we've got some video footage on our presentation. I couldn't email it over. It was kind of too big to share. So kind of just let us know if there's any glitches, if you can't hear things properly or, you know, there's any any technical details that you've missed. We will share the presentation to be emailed out minus the videos at, um, to the administrator. And um, yeah, we'll, we're going to present, I think, for about 20 minutes and then we're going to take questions after. So we'll kind of go through it and not pause for any questions. So we won't see your hands anyway and we'll come back to questions after that. Is that OK? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Great. Fab. So I'm just going to get our um, get our presentation up to share with you. Um, this is where it all goes horribly wrong. Hopefully not. Let me know. Can you all see that? OK. Yeah. Great. OK, so as you've, you've introduced us, I'm Jenny Weller. I'm the regional programme director. This is my colleague, Jail. So we're kind of sharing our screen a bit and we'll we'll I'm going to begin and then Jail will be talking to you in a little while. So just to say it was September 2020 when we came to speak to you last. And really, I suppose we were kind of at the beginning then of the regional programme. And as you're probably aware from that point, you know, Caffili have taken the lead role in the development of our service across the region from hosting two of the regional posts, myself and the kind of res resource coordinator, but also in the strategic development of this mental health service for children with complex needs, looked after children. So Gareth's role in particular as my supervisor and lead, but also kind of instrumental in our a regional management board as well, really helping the integration of this kind of mental health programme within a social care system. So I just want to kind of big up Caffili really for supporting that development. I think it's been pivotal in moving forward in the programme. So, um, you know, we've, we've recruited, as you can see, our final team for the programme, um, which was the Newport area. So we're now operational in each of the Gwent local authority areas. And as we know, the, we've recruited a, a, a kind of amazingly skilled team, but they don't come in kind of fully developed. So we, Jail and my role in particular, have been in, immersed in an induction and fundamentals programme for that team in particular, whilst also kind of developing and sustaining the, the, the practice across the programme as well. So we're really pleased to say that the team are, are now actually operational and working with children and families in Newport and already actually making, a, a, you know, quite a difference in that area in particular. So we've also um, moved last year into, we I think we just recently moved in July into this space, into Victoria Village School, and it's now finished. And uh, currently we're hosting all the teams here. I'll talk a bit later about the Caffili services actually moving into its 
new bargoid, bargoid base at the end of July. So just want to kind of just show you a, a video now of young people who've been making their mark on our our buildings and our premises with their with their art and it, you know it's an opportunity for us to showcase the talents of the young people often the young people we work with are seen as a kind of problem in the system and their talents and their strengths of, often don't get showcased you know to the point where often people feel they need to be out of county and in specialist care but we know with the right conditions any child or young person can thrive in their local communities and in their local context. So I'm just going to play you on the next slide. Fingers crossed it works. Just an, just an example of some of the artwork of the young people we work with. It includes Kafili young people as well. Oh, I've gone on. Sorry. Oh. Go back. Skip too far. Press up. Okay, so other things that we've kind of developed and are developing, just want to kind of say the investment and sort of community presence of our new Bargoid base is going to be, you know, amazing for the service for children and families, but quite a regeneration in that area of Bargoid. It's, I don't know if you know that it's the um, old Woolworth store that was opened in 1923 and now it's been we were lucky and fortunate to apply myself and Gareth for a capital grant from the Integrated Care Fund so we had a significant amount of money from Welsh Government which also Caffili have supported as well so we're, we're really looking forward to moving into that Bargoid base which I'll show you a few pictures in a minute of, of the renovations that have been going on there um, and, it, you know, we did a site visit last week to Bargoid and just the investment and looking at the high street of what that means, uh, I think, is going to be pretty important for the families and children and also the high street in Bargoid. So we're really excited to be actually present in the community in Bargoid. Um, and also, I think the other development that we've had since we were with you last was a model in Caffili of actually investing in Caffili children's homes so I don't know you're probably all aware kind of more acutely aware of in the Labour manifesto document that you know a real pledge to move away from private paying profit making care for children's services and into developing local resources and local solutions so again it's a kind of um, progressively with Caffili we're kind of really investing it's a very new kind of provision. Currently we have one post, Ridian, a lead therapeutic practitioner, and a couple of days of Becky, our team psychologist, sort of investing in trying to sort of develop a kind of psychosocial, so psycho psychological and social model of care into the residential care for, for Kofili homes. And what we know is in the private sector, often children have to move quite a lot. And we know that it's not the solution and it's a very expensive but also not good quality for kids when they have to move around so we're we're kind of very hopeful that the impact we can make is that children can remain in those homes with a kind of step in and step out provision as well with you know Caffili missed the community miss being the community option and then we've also got the kind of residential home option for Caffili children as well so again a, a, a kind of quite a quite a big development that I'm trying to capture in a couple of minutes for you but that's kind of where early days in that so I just want to show you now some of the pictures of our Bargoid building
as you can see, it's kind of looking not as glamorous as it will be. And we are kind of hoping we're on target to move in, I think, the last week of July. We're also, um, I didn't say on the slide, we're going to be co-locating with the IST team, the intensive support team. So um, another children's services team who kind of work really much on the edge of care to prevent children and families coming into care. So we're hoping, of course, that we influence each other's practice, share good practice and get that kind of common value base and um, ideas of how we can work better together to help children and families in Kifili. So that's a kind of exciting development for us as well, sharing. It's a very big space to, to make it quite personal. It's going to be quite a challenge for us. So we just, just want to, I know you're really interested in impact and Jail's going to talk through a kind of particular client story that we have, but just want to say really this, I think our kind of performance speaks for itself. I'm not going to say too much, but currently we're, the regional programme is working with 55 young people across the Gwent area, which is, you know, a significant rise for us in terms of working with sort of originally, you know, 15 young people in Torvine to where we are today. We have a very low disruption rate in our placements, which we're very proud of. As I mentioned previously, children and young people don't have to experience sort of multiple moves. And just that figure really about the, the kind of savings. So it's not only the quality of the outcomes that we can achieve for children and young people. We really started, we've been working so hard on our data and evidencing, you know, what the cost savings are around that. So you can see for, for Kifili in particular, they're pretty significant. In terms of the performance across the region, Kapili sits kind of um, very high, as you would expect developmentally. We've been in Kapili now for over four years, and um, you know some of the other services are newer in their development. So we'd expect Kapili to be almost up there on the tops in terms of the development of where we've come from. And you can see the reliance on residential as that option for children's care is low as, as a percentage of the total children's looked after population. So I know you want to might want to ask me sort of questions about that later so I can talk more about our performance and data, but I really feel like the figures and the outcomes speak for themselves. So I won't say too much about that. And just another kind of bit of feedback for you to see as the, from the committee perspective, we're incredibly proud in Kefili of our work with birth families. So we know, again, it's possible, given the right conditions, that we can actually place children in specialist out-of-county security <laughs> units straight back into their birth families. So these are just some of the kind of quotes that we've done in a recent, you know, we try to get feedback every year from our clients, um, our families and professionals that we work with. And I feel like some of these quotes I pulled out just really capture what we're trying to do, which is, you know, to work with the whole family unit, not just the individual child. I don't know if you re remember from our previous presentation, we're kind of aware that the system is as much as the solution as working individual, you know, we're not an individual child model. So just some of those quotes kind of really capture some of the things that we, we hold dear to our work with families. OK, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Jail now. Okay, so when we've been to see you before, um, you've said we, that we really want to hear in more detail about young people's stories and your work in detail. So we picked out um, an example of a family that we've worked with. And uh, this is a 15 year old girl from the Kavili Borough who we've called T for this presentation. Um, and our role, as you will know, is to provide an alternative to residential and secure placements, um, stepping this girl down to live with her dad, where she's lived um, together with her dad in the Kefili Borough uh, since November last year, so eight months into this placement so far. Just to give you a little bit of her background, really, because it's important for us because we understand children's presentations in terms of what they've been through in their lives. And children often will always make perfect sense when you look at what they've been through and what their circumstances are. So for T, her background was that her mum and dad had significant drug misuse problems during her early years mental health problems, and were also in a, a relationship with, that was violent. And she moved frequently between different family members in her early life. So she experienced a lot of disruption and change. 
And very, very sadly, her mum died from a heroin overdose when T was 10. Um, a real tipping point for the family really was obviously uh, T's mum's death. But unfortunately, um, when T then moved in with her maternal grandparents, a year later, her grandfather died as well. And this was a real tipping point for her nan, who felt that this was all too much, really, and she couldn't continue to care for T. Um, around the time of 11 to uh, sorry, 10 to 11, of course, young people move from primary to secondary school. And something we often see is when children move from the relatively nurturing context of a primary school into the bigger challenge of a secondary school, things can become really hard for them as well. So at that time, T had had these two very significant bereavements and moved to secondary school. And she was quickly excluded from school due to uh, hitting another child in school. Um, at that time, we actually became involved to see if we could support T to live with her nan, but it wasn't something her nan felt she could continue with. So then there was a search for could T live with anybody else in the community and certainly an issue for us and our colleagues in social care is the availability of foster carers to, to care for all children actually but particularly children with complex needs and sadly at that time there weren't any family members or foster carers who could care for T. So she moved into residential care. And just to say really linking as a, as a specific example of Jenny's um, bit earlier point Children don't necessarily stay uh, stably in residential or specialist care provisions. So T moved uh, to a total of seven different um, residential and secure placements in the last few years of her being in institutional care. Um, and many of these struggled to manage her needs and sometimes gave pretty immediate notice saying we can't care for her anymore. You're going to need to find another placement. Um, so I think an assumption often is um, when children are very challenging to care for, what they need is more and more and more extraordinary care. But actually, T is an example um, of what we often find, which is children re respond better to care, which is in more ordinary circumstances in families and communities with their local networks. The kinds of difficulties that T was having and made her really challenging to care for at that time, she would become very, very, very angry, very full of kind of white hot rage, really. Lots of smashing up property, setting fires, being aggressive, going missing in a way that was obviously really worrying for carers, uh, using drugs to cope with her feelings um, and some antisocial behaviours in her community, too. So. Absolutely a girl that was very, very distressed and very hard to care for at that time. Just to give you a bit of a sense of what we do um, in our work. So part of what we do is look for possibilities and look for people's strengths and look for the maximum that carers and families can contribute to children. And what we often find is um, parents that were going through difficulties when their children were very small and perhaps they couldn't look after them at that stage or an earlier stage of development. Parents can be in quite a different place when their children are older and teenagers. Also that parenting a teenager is a different task to parenting a younger child and that can be more of the strengths of particular parents. So part of our work in the system is to look for these possibilities and keep reaching out to families and say, what's the most that you can give to your child now? And when um, T's residential placement gave notice again on her and said, we can't look after her, her dad stepped into the breach and we worked really closely with our social care colleagues to make an assessment of whether it was safe for them to live together. They have a really strong bond and a really high commitment to one another. And we're going to show you some um, creative work from T a little bit later. And she refers to that really about how hard she found it to take and respect and trust care from people who were paid to look after her um, and trust that they really cared about her, whereas she trusts that her dad really cares about her. So it's what she wants and she wants to make it work um, in this placement with her dad. So our work involves coaching adults about how do they understand children? How do they meet their needs? How do they get through crises? 
Um, and how do they uh, recover from the impacts that looking after the child has on them as adults? Because it's obviously a stressful thing to do for adults as well. Um, we help T to look at her reliance on drugs to manage her emotions and, and traumatic memories and teach her skills in using psychological coping strategies. Um, we've got a 24 seven on call service. So our intensive work and why we only work with 55 children and not, you know, 1055 children is because we can be very responsive. So we're there to coach um, the child and their carers um, through crises. So we go out in the night, we might spend the night sometimes with the family to get them through the night. We might spend whole days and the week and the weekends being with the family in their home to help them work through the difficulties. Um, so intensive work. Um, also just important to say that T has been through a lot of trauma in her life, which we believe is at the basis of why she behaves as she does and why she struggles as she does. Um, but it's very important in psychological work to help a child stabilise before opening up, looking back at the trauma and trying to process the trauma that they've been through. So by that I mean a stable placement, um, trusted relationships, coping skills to deal with strong emotions, and then we can look back at traumatic things like, like lo losing your mum when you're 10. Um, also, just working as a professional system to manage risk with all our professional colleagues in a network very, very closely with social care and education. And T now has a really good, highly bespoke education plan where she can work at home. She can work in a classroom with people that know her really well. And, and that's going well. Just to say a little bit about progress. So there still are intense emotional episodes and there still are some of the behaviours I mentioned earlier. Um, this is long term work. It doesn't change overnight. Um, but what we are seeing is the episodes are less frequent, they're less severe. And T and her dad recover more readily for them and bounce from them and bounce back. We can see them using the skills and strategies that we've taught them to use the psychological coping strategies we can see them starting to ask for help proactively so they can tell a problem's coming and we can get in early to avoid things escalating. They're also willing to really accept our help during a crisis. So there was quite a long time for T that when she got overwhelmed with feelings, everybody else felt like the enemy. Now she's saying to us things like, I don't know what I'd do without you. So she's learning to rely on people and trust people. And that's a really big deal for her and, and a lifelong skill for her to have. Um, she has really good relationships and regular contact with her extended family. So with what Jenny was saying earlier, if we can keep children local, if we can have local residential care to have the briefest period in and step back out, then children's family relationships aren't disrupted. And these are really protective factors for children. Whereas if they have to go all around the country into different placements, those kinds of things get broken. Just some good news, really. T was recently on a recruitment panel for a new team member in our Caffili Miss team, and she did an incredible job and she had some great experience. And part of our work is tackling problems, but a lot of our work is also building strengths and a sense of self-esteem and worth and getting in touch with what people are good at and what's worth living for. Um, T has an aspiration to be a cleaner. She she loves a tidy house. She loves to make a home. Um, she wants to have a positive role um, in society and have a good job. Um, so, so that's great. And she also wants to make music to express her life experiences. Um, and what we're going to show you next is just a rap that she has made about her life experiences. Now, there is a little bit of a health warning on this, that there's some swearing in it. Um, which we've tried to uh, blank out, but just wanted to kind of acknowledge, we appreciate that, um, you know, respect the committee really, but also wanted to be able to show you T's expression of her experience in her own words. So please excuse uh, the swearing in this part. I think we've bleeped it out. We've well. bleeped it out, <laughs> you'll see that it's there. Okay.
Okay, I hope you could hear that okay. All right. I, so couldn't, just... hear any, I couldn't hear anything. I don't know about anybody else. Oh, shall I, I... Could, I was reading the words. <laughs> can we go back? Can we go back? Have we got time? Because I can. Mm. I could. We could read it, Jenny. Yeah, we, we could read it. It was fine. Oh, the music was really. I think there was a thing on the top I needed to click. I'm really sorry because there's a lovely. Um, yeah, really apologies. This is the technical glitches today when we were playing it. Did you hear the music on the other clips as well? No. It was the, the so there was music on the other clips. Really sorry, but I think there's something you have to pull down and try and get it to shoot when you share a screen for for the music to play. So I really apologise for that. Okay. Um, so just to end really and where we're going forward obviously we're you know extending Mr Moore children across Gwent with as I've mentioned Caffili being you know key to that and you know part of mine and Jail's role in particular is now developing the lead in each of our team to ensure that the quality of our work and the, the clinical outcomes and the work remains high so what we can achieve, achieve which we've hope, hopefully demonstrated through the impact for young people and their families we really want to kind of, as we've shown you some of the artwork and rap, we feel like sort of creative therapies are something that our young people in particular really relate to. They're not able to come in and talk about their issues, but they're able to access more of their emotions, feelings, um, build their kind of more of those protective factors through more creative approaches. So we're, we're kind of talking and thinking about that within our programme really keen as we work with all the kind of tiers of need within Caffili that we want to kind of influence the provision of mental health care to vulnerable children and families. We know a lot more children are kind of experiencing mental health difficulties due to the pandemic, but also access to services and the right kind of service at the right time for children and young people, I think is key. So we're kind of keen on influencing more of that within Caffili and as I mentioned earlier, just really continuing to think about and developing the approach in your residential care homes. We want to kind of really work hard on that and, and develop our evidence base even further to um, show you with statistical data, but most importantly, what children and families themselves tell, about, tell us about what they need and what makes the difference. Okay, and just some contact details on the end of our presentation which I will share just going to come off sharing screen hopefully you can I can see all of you I'm so sorry about the sound I I tried it earlier and I got the sound playing but I missed uh, so apologies for that if anyone would like to yeah hear it with the music please be in touch and we can play it we can't just send it because it's too big to um send via email that's okay. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. It was quite interesting. I actually got a few questions, but I don't know if any of the officers have got anything to add to your presentation before we ask members if they've got any questions they'd like to ask. No? Okay, then, uh, Councillor Bazina, would you like to ask something? Yeah. Um... I'm always, always impressed with your your presentations. They're always the ones that completely stand out with me and they really do capture my heart, especially that story then. Um, and it's just a, an amazing uh, success story, I guess. Um, what I was what I'd like to ask is obviously when they reach 18 into adulthood, would they still be eligible for extra support? Because obviously, we would want to make sure that, you know, this individual doesn't step back. Um, and also, is there some kind of scope for some kind of mentorship for this individual? Because she has literally, with the help of, of everyone, has turned her life round through, through this. Um, and I think it would be really beneficial for other other children and other families that are coming through that she could maybe explore some kind of mentorship or it's yeah. it's just something that you know should really be valued and 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 yeah. for others that can see you know the the success. Can I just um, address that second part of the question? Um, one of the lovely things about expanding as a regional program is that we've got more people involved. 
So we've got more service users, we've got more parents and carers, we've got more foster carers. And what, you know, one of the lovely additional benefits has been um, to share that resource across the region. So currently, um, we are establishing a group for um, family members who've been through the service and come out the other side um, so that they can be involved in various projects of mentorship um, to existing service users. I think having peer mentors is a real um, growth area, yeah. I suppose, in mental health services, certainly. Yeah. And similarly, having a group for young people. So we've always kept in touch with leavers, as we call them, and we get them back and um, we get them involved in recruitment and all of those kinds of things. Um, but having a more formal group who can offer mentorship to other young people is part of what we're yeah. building. Yeah. So, yeah, and just for the first part, um, we do continue post-18. If need be, we can work up to 21 with young people. It's rare. And what we're trying to get a lot better at, and we've done always, is equipping the system when we step young people out of the programme of what they might need. So really working hard for months on a transition programme of what the network might need to kind of be thinking about and influencing and learning from our work to help the system hold the young person following our intervention. Um, so that's part of the work we do. And obviously we spend quite a bit of time on ending processes with young people as well and their families. I was going to say that ending process must be very daunting for them at times uh, mm. as well. Um, so, yeah, it's absolutely lovely to hear that. Yeah, and because, you know, we're a re relational model through and through when young people can form those secure relationships with us. We want them to have a wider net then of adults in the future that they can access and take support from and be part of their own communities. And we see that quite significantly happen for young people, whereas we know when if they're away, they haven't got that opportunity to make that connections and often they'll land back at 16 or 18 and be, and be more troubled as adults because they have not got those local connections and they've broken those relationships with people that would have been significant throughout their childhood. The other thing that we do is stay really closely connected um, to the other professionals in their lives. So as their social worker continues on with them, for instance, because we might be involved with a child from eight till 11, you know, and they'll stay with their social worker, obviously, for a period. So we can have kind of top up sessions and keep meeting now and again. So we're not a million miles away to pull us back in if things feel like they're they're kind of getting harder for a child for a while. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay, Councillor Etheridge. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jenny. There are two points really. Uh, the first one is you you mentioned local resources, local solutions. I see that um, you say that it's all the local authority areas. My question is the first point about operational good practices and consistencies throughout Gwent. Um, do we then save on duplication costs and are we all working together? And the second point is on um, very similar to Carmel's point on peer mentoring, coping strategies and joined up working. Now, is there a timetable for that? Is there an action plan? Um, have you got um, measures in place for confidence building and it's all about non-judgmental non issues? Thank you. OK, shall I answer the first <laughs> bit and maybe you answer the second? That's bit? a big question. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah it's loads of I was going to say, got a lot of items, uh, strings yeah. attached to that question. <laughs> Great question. Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of the regional working across Grant affords us to kind of make sure then we're making the best of the resource that we've got and also that we can share um, good practice and ideas of what works in one area. You can think, oh, so we can actually... Um, have children in their local communities here. That means it's possible in Monmouthshire and Newport as well. So I think you can actually see the kind of credibility of the regional programme, avoiding duplication, but learning from each other as well. So kind of all the heads of service in each of the authorities are really engaged as are our health partners and education. But that real consistency then starts to happen across Gwent for this particular cohort of young people. I wouldn't say that happens across the board, but certainly for this group of young people. I think there's always a local 
you always have to pay attention to what the local landscape is though so the culture in Caerphilly is very different from the culture in Newport for example or Tawine so you've also got to have some differences from so you've kind of got this overarching regional program but also local variation so some of the things that Caerphilly have in place Newport won't some of the things Newport have Caerphilly don't so you're you're kind of tweaking and adapting and being flexible to what the local landscape are as services as well which I think again is the beauty so you've got the kind of regional but then local locality so really our teams are embedded in Caerphilly in Newport so does that answer that bit? Yeah I just give a you know I, in my previous life I worked in Astrid Gunlais and we had a problem there with people with with mental health and some people were known in the community in Astrid Gunlais so they said can we go to Brecon Kevin because we don't know anybody there and we prefer to be out to the locality and yeah. that actually helped them. Yeah mm. it can for some people yeah. absolutely one answer there. And I, I think it's worth kind of saying really that um, even though, uh, even before we were a regional programme, when we were just in Torvine and Caerphilly a, a while ago, children might sometimes be placed outside of their local area, but very close by. So we as a Gwent service could still work intensively with them, but sometimes they needed to be in Rhonda area, for instance, mm. um, because, yes, it they had certain family relationships or connections or um, memories of thing, difficult things that had happened in an area that were really hard for them. So they needed to be a bit away, but not yeah. in Scotland or in London or, you know, somewhere where they had no relationship or cultural connection, where the trip. The journey back home was a really long one, I yeah. suppose. So, so there's that. In terms of um, psychological coping strategies and sharing and um, peer mentoring and, and, and all that kind of thing, um, it's been amazing to have these bases, these big spaces. So Victoria School, people may know it. Um, I know a lot of people in Torvine have, have been to school here, um, taught here, sent their children to this school when it was an operational school. It's a big space. Um, and what we're able to do is have is bring children together that are both involved in MIST at the same time. So to, to try so some of their difficulties is how to cope with other people, how to share, how to negotiate, how to cope when they feel a bit provoked by other people or someone's not being particularly sensitive to their needs and upsetting. How do they cope? How do they contain themselves? So we've just had so many more of those opportunities in bigger spaces, shared spaces, but also multiple teams. We haven't been able to do it during COVID, but we were starting to be on the road of like um, group days out together. So a trip to the beach with everybody. But of course, we haven't been able to do group things um, during the pandemic. But um, certainly sharing, having young people to young people, co-working with staff. I feel that's been... Um, it's more than the sum of its yeah, parts yeah. to have coverage over the five areas. I hope that makes sense. And just, you. you know, we have continued all our face to face work during COVID as well, just to kind of mention that too. Thank you. I think that was one of the questions I was going to ask whether or not um, if you are doing face to face, um, you know, working. Um, can I just ask? Uh, the old Woolworth Centre then, will that include uh, sort of therapy rooms or rooms where they can go and ch uh, yeah. chat to yourselves and things yeah. like that? Yeah. And I just, oh, my heart goes out to this young girl, well, this teenager, what's happened, you know, and I think maybe early intervention really could have helped her uh, to deal with the loss. Is uh, Having a loss full stop is bad enough but having a loss at such a young age and then a secondary loss just a year later must have had such a traumatic effect on her my heart just sort of goes out to her um right is there any other questions that anyone would like to ask please no well i'd like to personally thank uh jenny and jail uh, for the contribution, it was really, honestly, I thoroughly um, appreciate what you got, what you're doing, um, and to thank you. I don't know if any other officers would like to add anything further to the presentation or tie things up. Nothing to add to the presentation, Chair. But again, uh, thank you, Jenny and Jill. Um, 
you made a huge impact on us last time uh, and saw you here again. I wouldn't be surprised. I'd be very surprised if this is the last time that we see you at Scrutiny Committee. I'll, I'll um, get, get the music sorted out, Dave, next. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, um, it was, yeah, absolutely. Technology. Uh, not, you know, extremely grateful for everything that's being done. This is very much at the preventative end of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and it'd be wrong, really, if we didn't go through this. And I didn't acknowledge Gareth's part in this. He is a huge advocate of MIST. Uh, he's always in my office, but uh, my virtual office these days, badgering me for money or something to support. The <laughs> um, but it always, yeah, absolutely. Uh, always steals money well spent. So it's really good having Gareth there as such an advocate of the project. And you can see already the impact that the, these guys' hard work is having. You know, this is, yep, yeah, it's, it's exciting in what it does in sort of cost avoidance. I get quite excited when it generates savings, but really this is about, you know, fundamental support for some of the most vulnerable people that we've got in our communities, and we're very, very lucky to have it. So thank you both. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I can only reiterate what Dave just said. Um, you know, it's lovely to see the intervention that's gone on there, and it's actually at a local level. I'm a big believer in keeping things as local as possible, um, you know, especially when it's young people and they have to travel further afield uh, to participate in these sort of uh, things. And again, agree with Dave, uh, the savings sound really well, and I'm sure Gareth has been doing his best to utilise them. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It was really appreciated. Now I'm going to go off and get myself a tissue and uh, get on with the rest of the meeting then. <laughs> Thank you for asking us and hopefully see you again. Thanks very oh, much. I'd love, to, I'd love to see when um, the the building work is all completed up in, yeah. up in the Woolworths, old Woolworths building. Yeah. I can remember shopping up there as a youngster. So. <laughs> Well, we're really hopeful. We were we've got ministerial looking, so uh, hopefully post COVID, and we can do something that we will um, have that opportunity to kind of showcase what what resource we've got in Barvoid as well. But yeah, absolutely, come oh, and fantastic. come and look at the building. Oh, thank you very much, both. It's, it was truly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I think we need to go back to the agenda now, and it's agenda item seven, which is the annual review of complaints received under the Social Services Complaint Policy, 1st of April 2020 to the 31st of March 2021, and these go from pages 15 to 25. Now, I think Councillor Cook is uh, pre presenting it, and Day Street and Nicola Broome the Complaints and Information Team Manager. Okay. Thanks, so Jake. I... Sorry, can I come in? Is that okay? Yeah, 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 that's fine. So I don't know if you could see me, my camera's playing up. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, so um, again, like long-standing members of the committee will be aware that each officer brings forward the annual review of complaints and representations received within the directorate. And yeah. tonight's report covers the period from the 1st of April, 2020, to the 31st of March 2021 and also includes the details of the compliments received. Social services departments are required to have a separate complaints process from the rest of the authority and we have a team in the directorate who oversee this work. Nicola Broom, who heads up this team, is unfortunately on leave today, so Gareth Jenkins will present tonight's report. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Gareth. Yep. Thank you, Chair, uh, and a great introduction there. I can tick a few things off my uh, little uh, notes here in terms of uh, Councillor Cook covering some of that off, but you, <laughs> members will be very aware that this is an information item that, that periodically comes before you uh, for you to note. Um, as Councillor Cook says, social services do have a separate statutory complaints procedure that they have to follow, which sits outside but is, is complementary to the corporate complaints policy that, that we sometimes have to in, in invoke as well. Now the, the report itself describes the three key areas of activity for the team and then goes on to detail that activity in each area. I must point out that um, at paragraph 5.1 there is a there is a number typo mistake in the middle line. Section 5 describes the activity and from should read section 5.6 onwards the activity data is provided. So mm. if you, you can just see that and just bear that in mind. Okay. Um, the three key areas that are outlined in the report will be very familiar to committee members. Um, so we look at representations which are made on behalf of service users by third parties, for example, by yourselves. 
Um, we look at complaints, which covers the three stages of the statutory process, so stage one, stage two, and then referrals to the Ombudsman. And then finally, at the end of the report, we've got the complements detailed uh, and some of the surveys that we've, we've undertaken. I really don't intend to take you through the detail, but I just wanted to highlight some of the key information in each of those sections. So from 5.7, you'll see the representations activity is detailed. We had 69 representations broken down by referral source, which hopefully is, is quite helpful. No surprises there in terms of MPs, members of the Senate and elected members make up the top three, uh, as you'd expect really, in terms of representing constituents and, and citizens of Caerphilly. Um, from 5.10, the report focuses on stage one of the complaints procedure and the department received 129 stage one complaints which is a slight reduction from last year of 144, which is, but is about average for the last three or four years. So, so we're not concerned about that. And if you think of the times that we've been in, and you know, it's pretty good that we've maintained, well, it's not good that we've got the complaints in the first place, but you understand it's pretty good that we've maintained a regular um, level. Of those 129 stage ones, 25 complaints were closed down because other processes were in place. And that usually means that, particularly for children's services, there are court proceedings and any issues that that uh, a family wish to raise yeah, that they're concerned about if they're in court then then their legal advocate is the best person to raise those concerns so we, we tend to signpost them to the legal process rather than deal with it through complaint once proceedings finished if if a family is still concerned then then absolutely they, they should come back through the complaints process hope that makes sense six of the complaints were upheld um and there's detail of, of the outcomes of those complaints from 5.18. Um, nine were partially upheld and 86 were not upheld. The report talks about three complaints at stage one being ongoing, but of course, since the time of that report being completed, I can confirm that they, they've concluded now and those three were also not upheld. Okay. Uh, from 5.24, the report focuses on stage two, and similarly, the department received nine requests to proceed to stage two. Um, the re report refers to one that was in progress, and I can confirm that there are now two in progress. Um, four were completed, and three were refused as they didn't meet the criteria for stage two. And then as we move on from 5.27, referrals to the Public Service Ombudsman for Wales are detailed. The department received 14 inquir inquiries from the Ombudsman. Seven were investigated by the Ombudsman's office and confirmed that Caerphilly had followed due process in all seven cases. Three were superseded by court proceedings, that issue I just referred to. So the Ombudsman felt that it should go back through the court process and, and come to us later. Three complainants were asked to provide more detail to the Ombudsman and they failed to do so in a reasonable time. So the Ombudsman closed those cases down and one case was deemed by the Ombudsman themselves to be completely out of time scale. It's very historical concern. Um, I know I'm whizzing you through, but you've got a big agenda this evening, haven't you? And, and I'm conscious of the time already. And then finally, from 5.30, we outline the 153 compliments that were received by the department. No surprise, and, and I've rehearsed this time and time again in committee, is that the majority of those come through adult services because partly because of the nature of the services that are provided and the families that we're working with, and only 37 for children's. Um, that, that is a, a fairly average number, so that hasn't gone up or gone down. And there is a reference then towards the end of the report to the surveys that were undertaken across adults and children's and the, the feedback responses that are contained within the report. So I, I think that's about it from me. I, I'm obviously very happy to take any questions. Um, and I probably should have just stated at the very outset that, that the complaints and information team sits within Children's Services, which is why I'm talking to the report and I'm not sharing it with Joe, if that makes sense. So I'm happy to take any questions. OK, thanks, Gareth. Um, I think we did uh, in the pre-meeting have a number of questions that came up. Um, if I could just start with mine as a quick one. Oh, quick, it's just gone off. Um, yeah, on 5.5, and it says time um, established procedures, time scales, and best practice at all times. What is the time scale, and the, are they always adhered to? That's a that's a really tough question. Uh, I'm going to say. But the time the time scales uh we have to respond within seven working days to a stage one 
uh, and we have up to 20 something days, forgive me, I will get the information to you uh, for a stage two. I, I will confirm that on the email for, for committee members. What I would say is that the policy allows for those timescales to be extended for, for various reasons, um, often because information needs to be searched for, uh, sometimes it's historical, but we can only do that with the complainants agreement. And so in, on that basis, I would say, and I, I can assure you that we've got 100% compliance with the policy because we seek um, the agreement from the complainant if there is to be an extension. And invariably, we, we get that agreement. Does that make sense? Yeah, if, if they don't agree, for instance, I don't know if you've ever had that situation where somebody doesn't agree, do they go on to stage two then, or no? Uh, to it's be not fair, upheld. To be no, no, not not at all. To be to be fair, we try and resolve everything at stage two, at stage one. Apologies before it goes to stage two. So mm -hmm. if if they don't agree to an extension to the timescale because of the reasons that we've we've requested, then we do our very utmost to meet the meet the deadline. Um, uh, and that means you know clearly sometimes you have to put additional resources into doing that. But as I say, we 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 touch wood. We invariably have agreement because of because of the way that we're um, building a relationship with the complainant. The team is really well versed in 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 trying to help the complainant to to work out what it is that they're actually complaining about. Because sometimes we get lots of issues put into into a letter or a telephone call covers lots of issues. So there's a lot of relational work that goes on that that builds that trust with the complainant. And so then when we ask for any extension and, and it's not it's not always the case, but when we do ask them for the extension that they usually agree. OK, that's lovely, thanks. Um, Councillor Etheridge. Gareth, just just two quick points. Um, I understand that uh, the complaints procedure was before the pandemic was discussed with elected members. Um, can you please tell me uh, how many elected members attended? And in regard the um, e-learning, um, I would like a, to know a figure there because I, I believe that a number of elected members um, may be unsure of the detail uh, process and procedures regarding the complaint. You know, I think I'm correct in thinking the stage one will go to like like the manager of the of the area. If then it's a stage two, it will then go to you or or, or David as the directors or assistant directors. But I, I just think perhaps a refresher um, uh, would be a good idea. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm going to look to committee services to, to support with this as well, to see whether there is any data, uh, any information in terms of members' attendance at those sessions, which are run by corporate information um, governance. Um, my understanding is that that uh, that they it was part of it's part of induction for a start GDPR training and, and complaints process is part of that um, but but we will certainly dig out that information and provide that to you okay you, you're absolutely right in terms of the stage one um, tends to be dealt with by by the operational managers um, the complaints and information team clearly take the lead responsibility for for coordinating that response and offer a level of independence and a level of challenge every stage one is signed off by by any stage one response is signed off by myself when we go to stage two then the report uh, eventually makes its way to the director um, and the the response to the stage two report is written with support from the team but but the, it's it's for the director to respond to so you're absolutely right in that sense yeah. Okay, I think uh, Kath wants to come in on this as well, don't you, Kath? Yeah, I was just going to mention, uh, yeah, we do keep records of members' attendance at training and seminars. Um, so I can I can go back and, and see if I could check the records. Uh, and if particularly I could mention, um, I could let the committee know um, the numbers of people on the committee who attended and if they, if they want some help or assistance in uh, accessing the course through the e-learning modules, we can certainly support them to do that. Okay. okay. Thank you, Is that okay, Kevin? Right, That's fine, Michelle, thank you. Michelle, I think you mentioned earlier that you had uh, something you'd like to mention on this particular agenda item. Yes, please. Um, Gareth, I just wanted, was wondering really, on um, 
in relation to the two matters held up for the adult services and the two held up for children's services, what were the changes made to improve the future practice? It mentions it in 519 and 520, but I don't actually see any detail of any maybe changes to the way staff do their, you know, reporting or maybe training for staff, that sort of thing. Um, in, in relation to the adult services complaint, the two complaints related to the same family, but were at different times. And the main issue there, and unfortunately is a recurring theme, is about communication and, and how clear that communication is. So there, there, there were, we were able to put some changes in terms of practice with that individual family, which we then share more widely so that, so that we're raising awareness with all staff about, about just, just to keep reminding them that they need to be thinking about how, and how they engage and making sure that parents fully understand and, and carers are able to engage in that process so they've got that information. Um, if I just have a quick look at um, the two for children's. Yeah, uh, to be fair, but both both issues, very, very individual cases, real issues um, for, for the, those families that we were able to resolve. Um, not a lot to change in terms of overall practice for, for children's services with either of those cases. But in 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 a similar way to, to the adult um, situation that I just described, we routinely capture themes that may be emerging. So we're constantly monitoring issues that, that are coming through the team so that if, if there are particular um, issues, particular themes that emerge, then we, we will look as a management team uh, within each within each division, either adults or children's, to think about, so do we need to do something about this? If we've had this number of um, similar issues being raised, now it could be across the board or it could be in a particular team, it might be an individual worker. Um, so, you know, we can, we can interrogate the data that we capture in order to identify any themes that may be emerging and we respond to that then accordingly by, by raising awareness and thinking about training needs across the, across the service. No problem. Okay. I, it's fine. I only ask because I think it's really important to use things as a positive. I'm I'm terrible for turning things on its head as a and let's make this positive. So what did we learn from that and how did we share that going forward? My team in network hates me because everything is always yes, but what's the positive? So I just wanted to try and tease out a little bit about what you'd learn from it as a team, really. And, and could that benefit? people in the wider, you know, families, families support in the wider sense, really, I suppose. So, yeah, thank you. I was a bit worried then, Gareth, when you said interrogate the data, that you can say interrogate the staff member. I do a bit uh, of that as well. Sorry? I can do Did a bit you? of that as well. Oh, no. <laughs> they calling the union on you. Um, Joe, you did actually have your hand up um, earlier, but you've put it back down. Was there anything you'd like to say or comment on? I was only going to say what Gareth thankfully said for me, but I, I think, Michelle, sometimes with some people, we develop very specific communication strategies because the issues often are that they're complex sorts of family dynamics and individuals. And then those strategies are helpful for all the practitioners and the wider groups, as well as the families, really. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. It was it was just, I suppose, an opportunity to learn from the work that you'd you done really, yeah. I suppose, as 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 a as a committee as and as as an organization in my own right. I was being a bit cheeky, maybe. Thank you. Okay. OK, well, thanks everyone for this. Um, is there any further comments that like to be made uh, regarding this report? No, uh, OK, then I think we can proceed now on to agenda item eight. You're going to have to forgive me because I'm flicking back and forth, like I said to you. And um, this is the Regional Partnership Board's updates. Um, Councillor Cook, I think you'd like to come in on and present present this uh, along with Dave. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, <clears throat> so members, you, you've received several reports over the last year or so on the work of the Gwent Regional Partnership Board. 
Tonight's report updates members on the work of the board over the past six months. It also references that we are also awaiting further guidance from Welsh Government as to the future role of the RPB, given the responses they received to their proposals in the white paper, rebalancing care and support in Wales. Further reports will be brought to the committee in due course. Thanks, Chair. OK, thanks, then, um, Shane. Uh, Dave, would you like to present the uh, paper, please? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Shane. Uh, as Shane's uh, alluded to there, you've had several reports over the last year or so uh, on the work of the RPB, the Regional Partnership Board. So apologies, this might feel a little like Groundhog Day. Uh, there's only so much that we can that we can report really, but uh, you can see under under paragraph 5.1 of the report that the RPB has met on several occasions since you last uh, received the report from us. Uh, and really, in terms of the work, it, that is centred around three specific areas. Uh, the first of those, unsurprisingly, uh, are the continued impact of the coronavirus. Secondly, um, we've been very much vexed in the world of discussing with Welsh Government uh, the continuation or other ways of grants that we currently receive, particularly around the transformation grant <coughs> and the integrated care fund. Uh, and we've also done a lot of work in responding to Welsh Government on the white paper that we brought to you in March, uh, which was rebalancing care and support in Wales. And again, I'll come to that a little later as well, if I may. In terms of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, little doubt of the second wave that we experienced had a far greater impact on health and social care than the first wave. Um, fortunately, we are now appearing to come out of that and we're seeing a return to some kind of normality. But as I'm sure you can imagine, we, with current things going on around Delta uh, variants, etc., it is something we are not taking our eye off at all. So as we proceed and, and move back services, as I say, to some kind of normality, we're doing that very firmly with one eye over our shoulder in terms of what may be coming in, in some kind of third or fourth wave or whatever we are at the moment. Um, <laughs> One of the things we're very mindful of and one of the key pressures that we are going to face over the next couple of months is you will have seen in the media a, a lot recently around some of the backlogs of the NHS face and um, some of those elective treatments that had to be put off because obviously the hospital were full of people with coronavirus. As those normal services resume, those hospitals now will fill up with inverted commas, ordinary patients. So what we will see certainly in adult services uh, is an awful lot of pressure coming our way to discharge people safely and timely out of hospital so those beds can, uh, can continue to be used. Now, if you look at some of the statistics that are being quoted in terms of things like backlogs, it is quite eye-opening. So we are going to be seeing the pressure on those services for a, a little while. And I think that's going to be particularly the case in terms of, uh, of domiciliary care services and certainly occupational therapy services. So that's something we're having to watch quite closely. Uh, I referenced grants a little bit earlier on. Uh, we have been the, the beneficiaries of transformation grant funding um, and integrated care funding. And you can see under paragraph 5.6, I've referenced some of the services that are, are, have benefited and we've been able to put in place because we've been recipients of that funding across Gwent. That's very important, uh, I stress that. The grants that we've been received have been for the provision of those and, and development of those services across Gwent. So it's very much about the, the regional model. Um, the grant funding was expected or initially anticipated to continue until March 2021, but obviously with the pandemic in full flow, fortunately Welsh Government uh, agreed the continuation of that grant, grant funding through until next March, March 2022. Um, and we are currently in discussions with them in potentially what may happen post March 2022. As part of the requirement of the grant funding, all of the programmes that we've put in place are being externally evaluated. So the Institute of Public Care, uh, CDR, CDR Associates, is all host of private companies uh, that have been funded by Welsh Government to do evaluations of the schemes. Um, and that's very much with a view to trying to determine which one of those, which of those schemes have added the most value uh, and potentially uh, would benefit from continuation. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, it, it is difficult 
uh, because at the moment we are very reliant on some of those uh, some of those new services, and we don't know whether they will continue post uh, March 2022. Now, in the event the Welsh government announced that the funding won't continue, then we'll only really have two courses of action, and they're laid out in paragraph 5.10. Um, we will either have to stop those services with a corresponding impact uh, on the people who use them, or we will have to continue to fund them from our core budget and have to make savings elsewhere in what we do. None of those are particularly palatable. Uh, we're making representations as a, as a director of social services across Wales in conjunction with the Welsh Local Government Association, really to persuade Welsh Government of the value of those schemes and for that funding to continue post-March. It would be helpful if we had notification of that as soon as possible, um, but we know from the way we've previously have to deal with this, it could well be in the last couple of months of the financial year before we get any kind of clarity on funding going forward. So that is something that, that is causing me uh, particular concern at the moment. Uh, finally, as I said, on the 16th of March, I brought forward a white paper, uh, the rebalancing uh, care and support white paper from Welsh Government, uh, which, which, if you recall at the point, suggested that regional partnership boards could be put on statutory footings. Uh, they could become legal entities in their own right. They could employ staff um, and committee uh, expressed a number of concerns uh, with regard to those proposals all of which were put in uh, the response to the Welsh Government, which is attached as Appendix 2 of this report. Um, I think it's been, it's fair to say that one of the constant criticisms of regional partnership boards from this committee have really been the lack of that democratic oversight and democratic accountability. And that was certainly factored into the response that we got to, well, from Welsh Government. Uh, we were awaiting the programme for government to tell us where that might go. Shane very kindly sent me that programme of government about 11 o'clock this morning. So I've only really been able to scratch my way through that. Uh, there's not a lot there. I don't think I couldn't find any reference to regional partnership or board at all. So what I did was I, I've spoken to the civil servants in Welsh government responsible for that piece of work. And what they've told me is the Welsh government will announce um, their response to the consultation replies they have by the end of this month. Um, what I do know from talking to those people, it, they had more than 160 responses and the vast majority had concerns around regional partnership boards being set up as legal entities. So we'll have to wait until the end of the month until we are clear on, on how Welsh Government see the, the future going forward. Uh, but obviously, I would imagine that is something that will factor quite highly uh, in the next report that I bring to you uh, on this subject. So that's very much the, the world between uh, December 2020 uh, and today, as far as regional partnerships, local boards are concerned, still hugely influential. Um, but really a little bit up in the air in terms of Welsh government, where Welsh government see their future. Thank you, Chair. Oh, thanks, Dave, for that. Um, I think when we was in the pre-meeting, we had quite a lively discussion regarding um, the RPBs. Um, so would you like to put your hands up to ask questions on this issue, if anyone's got any questions? I know there were a number of people who actually commented that they'd like to ask a question. OK, Councillor Etheridge, if you could go first then, please. You're on mute, Councillor Etheridge. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. A number of points, David. I was concerned to to you the view that the, the private sector is doing the evaluation of projects. Uh, it seems to be paid for by the Welsh Government. Uh, if I correct, and that does seem to me like a seems to be a bit of a money pit for um, RPB, but obviously that's the Welsh Government's decision. Um, first question then, David, and there's only two really, uh, and I think you mostly covered this. Um, at the present time, do you feel comfortable with the powers, accountability, communication and decision making of the Regional Partnership Board? And the second question is for yourself and the Cabinet member. Um, what influence do the Director and the Cabinet member feel they have over the Regional Partnership Board in raising agenda items, lobbying, challenging for and against 
a particular decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Etheridge. Um, whether I'm comfortable or not, is it's pretty academic to a degree. I mean, the RPBs are what the RPBs are. I think they could do with a much stronger line back into um, individual local authorities, whether that's cabinets, whether that's scrutiny committees. Uh, I think that's room for debate, and I think that's uh, very much centred in the responses the Welsh Government have had um that you can't continue sort of plowing you know what are relative well not relatively what are large amounts of public money uh into these boards without any kind of real democratic oversight certainly in terms of the way that we would normally work um we have brought reports forward to you to explain what's been going on but of course what we would normally do in Caffili is we would do pre-decision scrutiny um at the moment the way it works is at best we can do post decision scrutiny and that is very challenging um i'll let shane speak speak in a minute in terms of his issues but i mean as far as the influence the partnership board's concerned i mean we have a one-sixth influence if you like there's five local authorities um and health board on there uh, we have every opportunity to influence uh, the agenda we have a, a a a strong say in what is going going forward so i have no concerns there at all uh, the way the Gwent RPP is actually run, it's run very well. Uh, it, it's run in a very uh, fair manner. It's not dominated by one organisation or another. Uh, agendas are, are very, very long, sometimes overly long, quite frankly, and, and that does restrict our ability to discuss some of the detail. Um, but I think certainly if you looked at the seven RPBs in Wales, I think the Gwent one would be seen as one of the stronger ones. And I've certainly got no concerns at all around our ability to, to impact or influence its its agendas or its decisions. Shane, I don't know if saying you want to add to that. Yeah, thanks, Dave. But I was going to say I've been made king of Gwent and I make all decisions for everyone, but I won't do that. I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... It's basically, I, I agree what Dave said, and the RPB it stands for a regional partnership board, and the word partnership is key here. It's not just about me or Caffili, or the, it's about the board, it's a partnership between Blaine Gwent, Monmouthshire, Newport, Tova, and the health board, and together we make decisions for the Gwent area. As so I have a say and a vote if required, but I raise issues where I see best fit, and if I need to, but it's not just not only for Caffili, it could be any range and issue for the whole of Gwent. Such as, such as health services. So I agree with Dave and, and the meetings are very fair and they, they run very well. And we have very large agendas, which is, I suppose, a bit of a bugbear for me because it's very difficult sometimes to read the papers, especially if you haven't got the, the knowledge. Luckily, I have some NHS knowledge, so I do understand the way they write the papers, which is handy. But yeah, it's we do have influence and powers in that group. Okay, thank you. OK, is that OK then, Kevin, answered your question? Yeah, could could we just have, when the decision is made by the Welsh Government, could the Cabinet member and the Director send the decision out to, to the members of the Scrutiny Committee, please? Oh, yeah, I'm happy to do that, Councillor Asheridge. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Councillor Bazina. Can you He double-clicked. Is that better? Yeah, I have some yeah. colleague who double clicked on a regular basis. <laughs> Lost a lot right. of information. Oh, I know. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a question really for, for Dave. And obviously it's good that he shares our concerns in regards to uh, 5.3. Um, obviously, you know, as the NHS does move to move from the COVID situation uh, with operations getting up and running, and, and everything else that that comes with it, um, it is going to have a massive impact, an increase on our capacity and our workload. Um, and obviously, you know, dom care is particularly hard to recruit and to retain, not just for this authority, authority, but for you know other authorities. So, um, have we got some kind of imminent plan in place because we do need to to, to look at this really carefully, um, and um have we got any sort of recruitment plans coming up uh in uh, in the future for, for around dominic uh, for, for dom care um and obviously you know i know that i've highlighted this before but i think you know when the contracts do come up we we do need to have a discussion about the dom care situation about whether or not we can actually bring it back in in house whether that would help 
Um, I, I, we're on constant recruitment. We recruit not quite 365 days a year, but it feels like that. So we're always looking for home carers. We've always got adverts out. There's work going on regionally and nationally to try and make the uh, the sector one that's a little more attractive and perhaps we've enjoyed it historically. Um, I, you know, quite frankly, I don't think bringing it all back in at the moment would 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 help. Um, for me, it's about the additional capacity. Is how do you recruit more people generally? Just bringing what we've got in house is still only going to give you so many hours. We need that capacity to increase across Wales. It needs to be a more attractive proposition for people than it is. One of the things that I did see um, in the uh, program for government this morning when I was flicking through it was the commitment to the is it a real living wage? Is that the right phrase? The £9.50 £9. an hour? You know, that is a sizable increase, particularly for those people uh, who live in the independent, uh, sorry, who work in the independent sector. Uh, and all of those things will help us. Um, but, you know, there, there is a big, um, going to be a big demand for domiciliary care. The other thing which we have to factor in, and we don't know the answer to yet, is how quickly or otherwise our care homes will fill back up again. Um, because obviously, because of the pandemic, a number of deaths we are in, you know, uh, where there were live infections, we weren't able to put people into those homes. So homes are carrying lots and lots of empty beds. Yeah. Now, that's good in some ways that it means that we've got capacity. So, you know, should people need to come up to hospital into a care home, the beds are certainly there. Yeah. What we are worried about really is whether the sort of adverse publicity uh, there's, you know, despite the efforts of the care homes and they've been heroic in the pandemic, they have received quite a lot of bad press in terms of the impact of the pandemic. And will that make people reluctant either to go in themselves or to place their loved ones in a care home? And the answer to that is at the moment we don't know. So we're having to watch that very closely as well, because there is a danger here that when domiciliary care demand will go up and two, uh, demand for, domicile, for care homes will go down. Uh, with a double whammy impact of that. So we're having to watch it very, very closely. We don't know exactly how that demand will uh, will present itself. It's beginning to emerge quite significantly in one or two of our neighbouring authorities. That isn't the case in Caffili yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you like, you know, we, we've responded to the pandemic. The next priority for me now is really how we monitor and manage the fallout for the pandemic in terms of normal life being switched back on. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it's a really good uh, answer, Dave, to my question. And obviously, we're still in unknown territory as well with the with the uh, new well, the new variant that's going around uh, right now. But um, yeah, I do have great, great concerns about Dom Care and how, how we're going to have the capacity. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for that, Dave. Welcome. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, Michelle, I think you had some questions you'd like to ask. I just wanted to, yeah, just wanted to bring something up around 5.6. So um, apologies for my ignorance on this one, but um, there are five elements um, for the, that the partnership board have put to, together with the, the grant transformational offer. Now, if we jump across, sorry to be jumping, but if we jump across to 5.10, it then talks about if the funding ceases, the, uh, there are two options. One is that we'll lose the service. And the second one is that the services will be financed through social services core budgets. Now, my feeling is, is that were we, because this, uh, this is the crux of the question, really, were we in Caffili specifically involved with the Gwent transformational offer development, in which case we wouldn't worry about pulling that back to scrutiny and deciding how we were going to pay for it? Or is it that the, the Gwent Partnership Board saw a different vision for locally and would we end up um, with with projects or funding projects that were not were not actually key to the development for Caffili because they didn't come through scrutiny. That's the only reason I'm asking. Really. No, I, I think it's, it's it's slightly different to that, Michelle. I mean, what what basically happened was Welsh Government announced a, a figure of transformation board funding, which I think was 100 million pounds rings bells across Wales. Regional partnership boards were then given an opportunity to bid for that money. 
So it was, you know, it was a partnership decision to go for, and that's just a, a list of some of the schemes. It's by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, so we then put an offer together in, in Gwent, which I believe came to somewhere in the region of 13.7 million pounds. That was approved by Welsh Government. And the idea behind that was we were to go away and test these schemes, to put them in place, and then ultimately evaluate the impact of them. In Welsh Government's eyes, um, it's a very simple equation because what we should be doing um, is if these these systems work, then they will, free, in, in their eyes, they will free up our current budgets, which means that we can just move the money from one service, from the old service to the new service. It doesn't work like that at all, because obviously what we're finding is that the demand for those services is increased. So if I look at one there and I just pick it at random, there's the iceberg model, which is the child and adolescent support, mental health support for young people. It's not as though we brought that in and all of a sudden we had to stop spending the money elsewhere. What we've done, this is additionality. This has helped us to deal with complex cases, with waiting lists, uh, with support that wasn't great. So in essence, what it's done is extended our offer. It's increased the amount of service that we've been able to provide. We are now in that dilemma in that, that if the money uh, ceases in, in March 22, in essence, we will have to retract we will have less money overall, and so what do we do? We either either stop spending the new money or we stop spending the old money. That's what he means in essence. Now, huge pressure putting on Welsh Government so you can't do this. You can't you know, allow us to grow all these services. And like, you know, your comment, Kevin's comments around um, the private sector and the evaluations, but the evaluations are key. Because the you know if the evaluations are successful and are strong, I think that puts us in a very good place to argue for continued funding moving forward. I think if those evaluations had been done by us, for example, Welsh government would have said, well, of course you're saying it's a success. You know you're bound to. What else would you say? So I think an independent um, evaluation of the schemes is really important. Um, and we'll see where it takes us. But we are it is something that we are concerned around. Okay. OK, and I think the next one we got is from Councillor Bishop. Charlotte, would you like to come in? And my apologies for neglecting to welcome you on the committee earlier. You know I welcomed you privately on a message. <laughs> OK, um, am I unmuted? Yeah, well, I can hear you, but this you time can you speak. All oh, right, there we are. OK. Right, OK. Um, Thank you, firstly. Um, secondly, uh, 5.10, just going back to the points of the funding again, obviously none of us want to lose any services. They, they are vital in the community. Uh, my question is, obviously now you don't want to cease these, these services, no one does, but if there is no funding, where would you be taking the funding from? I, I couldn't tell you that. I couldn't tell you that now. I wish I could. I mean, what we would do is basically this would be added as part of the budget at the end of the year, or as we prepared our budget, um, we would have to uh, look at what that saving would be required. And then as part of our budget strategy, we would identify areas um, we're not where we would want to take the money because we wouldn't want to take it from any, but where we felt we were able to take the money. Uh, but what I can assure you, Councillor Bishop, is, is should we do that, that will come through the full scrutiny process as part of our normal budget setting process. So we would be coming in saying, look, we think we can take the money from A, B, C and D, and these are the consequences of doing that. And then obviously it, it's for members to quiz us on uh, uh, on whether that's the right thing to do or not, but they, they, you know, there would be some very difficult decisions here because there are some quite large sums of money. So all of our efforts at the moment are not going into looking for where they could be taken, the efficiencies could come from. They're all in, in, into the lobbying territory of trying to get Welsh Government to understand the consequences of that, particularly when you're trying to recover from a pandemic. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I got a couple of questions, but first, lead on to what you just said about the funding now, Dave. Can I ask you, where uh, in the Welsh government funds it? Do they fund it direct, or is it funded via the council? It's funded um, the health board of the treasurers, so that the health board receives the money off um, off Welsh government, um, and then basically they pay it on behalf of the local authorities. 
So might there be a possibility if you have to include it in the council's uh, funding in the future that the Welsh Government might, might up the funding to compensate for this particular element? I think it's unlikely. I think if, they, if they're going to continue, they'll continue to fund it via the Regional Partnership Board. OK, yeah. Um, going back to my original questions that I actually had uh, for you. For the lay people here, including myself, what is the iceberg model? Gareth, I'm going to pass to you on this one. Do you want to, uh, the iceberg model? He switched off like that then, didn't you, Gareth? <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. I, I got excited when you referred to it earlier and then it slipped away and I thought, no, we've missed the opportunity. Okay, iceberg model. <laughs> well, there we are, bring you back to the opportunity. The iceberg model is, is um, a framework that has been devised through the Gwent Children and Families Partnership. So very much partnership approach across health, education and um, social care, looking at how we um, meet the needs of, of a full variety of children and families. Um, we recognised several years ago, as we as we would all know, that that we're, we're pretty good at universal services. We need more of them, always do, but we're, we're pretty good at universal services. We're pretty good when you need specialist services, but there's this whole bit in the middle that is caught that we refer to as the missing middle. So we've got children and families who are not quite sure where to go, uh, who are not accessing universal services, but are not meeting the criteria for, for um, high tier level services, specialist services. And so the framework is meant to focus on how do we all work together in a more integrated way so that families, um, who need support get that support in the right place at the right time uh, from the right service. So some of you may be well be aware that we've set up the space wellbeing panels. So all GP referrals now come into one place. So GPs, when they've got concerns about children's behaviour and, and not being able to um, support families and parents, they can refer now to one place and, and those referrals get looked at on a multi-agency basis across CAMS, social care, third sector providers, families first, all of those services are there and represented and they look to identify the most appropriate service so that there's a, there's a quick engagement. So we recognise that early intervention and the speed at which we respond is really important. Now all of that framework comes under something that we call the iceberg model and, and in, in diagrammatic form what we're wanting is to get the clinicians, so the specialist um, people, out of their clinics and into the community more. So we're we're dripping it down oh, and, nice. and spreading it out more so that so that more families can access the service. But it's 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 a it's a it's making inroads, but there's still a long way to go. But it is something that is being recognized by Welsh Government and being held up as a as a as a good example of, of innovative integration working going forward. So it's it's critical. And and as as the discussion has been going, the funding for that is equally critical. You take the funding away, none of the core services are in a position at this stage to be able to replace that. So we're, we're lobbying constantly uh, with with Welsh Government uh, about maintaining that grant funding going forward. Is that helpful? Yeah, makes sense now. Um, yeah, the other question I've actually got is on 5.13. Uh, where it says members were particularly concerned around proposals to make RPBs legal entities. I know we briefly uh, discussed this earlier in their own right with the ability to uh, employ staff and commission services. Particular concern was expressed with regards to the lack of clarity on the enhanced role of the RPB and the role of elected members from local authorities in terms of scrutinising the role of the board. Now, I'd like to ask if anybody has any questions on this particular issue, because I actually do, but I'm offering it up to the members of the committee first um, if they'd like to ask any questions. OK, I don't see any hands up. So my question is, well, it's more of a statement, really, is that I I actually have concerns that um, that this will give another level uh, to the democracy and it has a higher cost implication. Um, so it's just mainly a question, uh, it's a comment regarding that, because if they have the right then to um, be uh, bodies of their own right, then and employ staff, there's going to be a higher cost implication there, isn't there? And that means, going back, if the Welsh Government doesn't actually fund us, 
that could that, uh, fund them, that could have a cost implication, knock on effect then to all the other uh, local authorities. I think one of the concerns was, you're absolutely right, I think one of the concerns was that one of the ways they would fund uh, regional partnership boards was by reducing funding to local authorities. So if the regional partnership board is, is delivering some of those services currently delivered by social services departments, then in theory you won't need as many or as big as social services departments. So you'll see a, a shift of resources, if you like, away from local government into this well, whatever it is, the, this mm. this sort of statutory partnership board, um, it, it seemed to be a, an opportunity for real confusion because you would have regional partnership boards be delivering some elements of care, um, whereas the NHS and social services departments continued to deliver other elements of care. So, you know, it, it sounded as it was it was beginning to build what was a very complex and, and a little bit bewildering picture. So, you know, um, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, as I said, the end of the month, I'm told uh, we'll get some sort of clarity on their intentions. Um, you just hope, you know, certainly you would hope common sense has prevailed. Uh, and the last, I mean, you know, if regional partnership boards can employ staff, there's only one place where those staff are going to come from, mm -hmm. and it's from social care. Um, you know, we've already talked about how we need to recruit more staff, not lose the ones we've got. So it, it comes with all sorts of connotations and problems. And we just have to wait and see. It was a consultation document. Uh, they've received those responses. We, we'll wait and see how they, they respond to the responses they had, really. Yeah, because I think it's going to be a double up, doubling up of services as well. And not everybody's going to you know, the general public is going to know about what the RPBs are and it's going to, you know, have a knock on effect and whether or not they'll be cohesive and, you know, everybody be working together. Whereas the Welsh Government, you know, what at the moment, even considering putting health and social care under one umbrella within the remit. So to have uh, this sort of knock on really, is it's like a doubling of services, isn't it? And another level of, uh, you know, democratic services, which I think personally, I think we could do without. Right, I think we need to go to a vote on this item. Am oh, yeah, I right? I think Michelle's got her hand up, Chair. Oh, sorry, I do apologize, Michelle. I didn't uh, see you. No, it's all right. It was just really to talk about a little bit about this in the third sector as well, because I think I, I need to mention it. Mm. Um, there's a percentage of the um, integrated care fund which goes through the regional partnership board, which should be targeted to services in the third sector for delivery. Um, and I know up to, I haven't spoken to anyone for a while, but I know they were struggling to actually um, commission or to grant fund third sector uh, to the, the extent that the Welsh Government was hoping. There were issues around that and mainly the issues were seeming to be because um, each local authority area is different. Each area of Caffili Borough is unique, you know, as far as my organisation goes. I know how we have to adapt and, you know, support different communities in different ways. And I think it's not an even playing field then when you look at the third sector across Gwent. And I know that one of the ways they're trying to work around that is by Garvo and TVA having some opportunities to offer funding you know on a lo more local level rather than Gwent wide because we personally we really struggled in the beginning with the Gwent partnership board because whatever we put a bid in for had to be Gwent wide and for an organization that is only based in one area it, it is a massive challenge so I just wanted to put that in there really that you know we, we're talking here about a lot of uh, issues around statutory and local authority and, and NHS delivery, but there's also a, a lot, a wealth of opportunity in the third sector that isn't getting a, supported because of the regional partnership boards way of working in a way and yeah you're absolutely you right michelle i think in the early days that was certainly the case i, I think yeah. it's 20 percent 20 percent uh, was the, yeah, i wasn't was the sure we didn't want to say anything be contentious no, that's scary remember very well because i remember sitting in the meetings on it um and i think to be fair you're quite right i mean what we then decided is in, is in order to assist organized third sector organizations we certainly use garvo and and tva um to try and win, encourage people and give confidence to, to bid. I think certainly, you know, people are much more flexible. I don't think you need that pan Gwent approach. You know, if you can do something in Caffili and that works in Caffili, then that will attract funding perhaps in a, in a way that wouldn't have when the RPB was set up. 
all those years ago, really. Okay, well, thanks Thank for that. You. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, report was actually for noting, so I think we can go on to agenda item nine now, which is the one that I've actually declared um, a personal interest in, uh, this, which is uh, social services co-opted member vacancies. Kath, would you like to come in and present this report? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this is for members who um, were members of the committee you may have recalled from last February. Uh, we considered setting up a, a subcommittee to look at appointing to the vacancy that sits currently on the committee. And we had three members appointed and uh, I progressed it in terms of seeking nominations and went through Garvo, for example, and we had some nominations in. Unfortunately, then COVID hit us and uh, there was no opportunity for the subcommittee to meet and um, consider the shortlisting of the nominees. Um, there were a few further right areas then um, once we started meeting again where the members who were appointed were unable to, to meet to consider it. Um, so in order to progress this now, I've brought it back to committee to seek new membership of the subcommittee. Um, I suggested in the report under 5.3, taking into account, Chair, that you, you already confirmed to me you were going to yeah. declare. Um, I suggest that the Vice Chair plus two other members of the committee be nominated. And following the discussion in the pre meeting earlier, I um, suggest that perhaps I have a reserve member as well, just to be sure that we can progress if we need to. So basically, I'm seeking um, if members want to nominate themselves or others um, to work uh, to plus a reserve. To, along with Councillor Carmen Pazina. Okay, yeah. Kath. Um, can I have a show of any hands of individuals that might be interested in actually sitting on this? We're looking for a total of four, but Scanting uh, Carmen, we're looking for three others. Uh, Councillor Evans, would you like to say something or put yourself forward? Yeah, Chair, I'll put my name forward. Okay, lovely. And Councillor Bishop, are you looking to put yourself forward? Yes, I'm quite happy to put myself forward. That's wonderful. We're looking for one further individual, um, if there's anybody interested. We do have uh, th the three. Uh, right, Councillor Gay, would you like to put yourself forward? Uh, yes, yes, please. OK, thanks, <laughs> Councillor thanks, Council Gay. Um, so you have the uh, three additional names, including Councillor Bazinia. So we need now to move the recommendations within the report. Is that correct, Kath? Yeah, Chair, you happy to move them on block, Chair? Um, yes, I'm happy to move them on block. Just take a second then. I'll second, now, Chair. Okay, we've got forms coming up now. So if we can all vote via the forms, and obviously we need to have um, verbal from Councillor Bishop and I think Councillor Gay, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah Councillor Bishop, would you like, are you for, against or abstaining? Four, please. Okay, Councillor Gay, four, four against please. abstaining. Right, lovely, thank you. Is that motion, who's got the squeakies? Somebody's got squeakies. Um, is that um, Carmel? It is. I can hear. I know it's Carmel. <laughs> that's yes. that's Car that's Carrie yes, Thank yes, you. No. <laughs> my apologies. That was me. He was going by path. <laughs> right. I think oh. we've come now to the conclusion of the meeting. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody for their attends attendance. My apologies for my confusion confusion right at the beginning because I was swapping back and forth and I haven't done it for such a long time. And I am rather new with this position. So, but thank you very much for your patience. And we look forward to seeing you soon. And take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Okay.